Well, good morning, Anchor Church, and Merry Christmas. There's one more week till Christmas, and I'm sure you're busy getting ready. So come on in. We'll take a, a breath here. We'll worship the Lord. Grab the uh, song sheets and the sermon notes. Rick's talking about John 16, 20, where Jesus tells us our grief will turn into joy. So we're singing a lot of Christmas songs about joy this morning. So I had a little taste of joy this uh, week taking my grandson Wesley to school. I sometimes help out doing that when Michael is flying. He flies for Delta, so he was flying this week. So I took Wesley. And we have a new car seat for him. So he turns forward now, and he loves sitting there. He was saying that he could see the trees and the cars. And then one thing he kept noticing in the sky, he said, that's my dada. He's flying. Oh, and there he is again. And, oh, there he's flying again. And I, I didn't have the heart to tell him, those are just like streaky clouds. They're not contrails. <laughs> but it gave him such joy to realize that his dad was there, and he was just excited about it. So um, it reminded me and helped me to understand that if we keep looking up at our Heavenly Father, that gives us great comfort and great joy that he is here and he has come. So let's sing. Stand up. We're going to sing Joy to the World. And there's a lot of Christmas songs with joy, so they're very wordy. So you guys keep up, okay?
Oh, dear Lord, what wonderful words that we are singing for Christmas. It's like the gospel all in one uh, season, Lord. It's wonderful. Um, I think about you are the giver of immortal gladness, and you were born to give us this, to have us be in your kingdom. You wrote that you came to seek that which was lost and to bring back that which was driven away, to bind up that which is broken, and to strengthen that which is sick. Thank you for loving us so much, and we want to give you back our hearts and our lives. And we thank you for this Christmas season. Amen. Okay, well, visit among yourselves and grab some chocolate and water. And Susie has gifts. Okay, there we go. Yay. Got some sound here. If you could find a seat, we are going to keep moving along here. So, uh, just a couple of procedural announcements. Just so next Sunday is Christmas Eve, so we will not be meeting at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. If you come here at 10 o'clock, the hotel will be glad to have you, but we won't be here. Four o'clock next Sunday, we'll be here for a sunset candlelight service. Hope you can come and celebrate the before the present opening frenzy begins. So come and let's celebrate the real meaning of the season when we get together. So um, we will be meeting on uh, December 31st, which is New Year's Eve, but it will be in the morning. So uh, you'll you, no problem. And then you can do whatever you want on uh, New Year's Eve evening, which, you know, for us usually means, yeah, bed by about 9, 30, 10 o'clock, you know, we're pretty exciting people, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, one important thing is um, if in this season of giving, you're planning to give to the church, hopefully you are, give to the Lord, uh, it's, and you need to use that as a deduction on your taxes that we need to have that for this year, you need to have that into the church by December 31st. So either mail it in or put it on the internet with online or bring it here to Sunday on the 31st or whenever. Just needs to be in by the end of the year. We need to receive it by then, not be postmarked, but we need to actually have it. So uh, make sure you get that in um, on time. Let's pray for just a moment. Father, we just rejoice. We've been singing about joy and that's a totally appropriate theme for this time of year. We see all the time, uh, you know, Lord, peace and joy and love, words associated with, with Christmas, but that is appropriate because that's what um, the coming of Jesus into this world was all about, bringing us peace, your love, and bringing joy into our lives. And Father, we thank you for that incredible gift 
of your son and what that means to us and the hope that comes along with it as well. We pray that you will just fill our hearts with your joy, not only this season, but all year round. And we pray this morning you will use this time to strengthen our joy and our trust in you. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So early in my treatment for melanoma in the past year, I experienced uh, an odd side effect. Um, You know, I counted at one point and I figured I had uh, about 16 different side effects. You know, when you see all those commercials for the pharmaceuticals and they all have weird names like Rexulti and Seralto and Jubilia and um, I had mine, or Yervoy and Opdivo, the two drugs they gave me. They, you know, they, usually those commercials, they have this long list of side effects. Well, I lived it. Um, you know, most of the side effects that I got were really minor. They were just not a big deal. You know, and you see on those lists, they usually have some that, you know, get a little serious. Like, you know, one of the side effects is death. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, well, you know, that's a little concerning. Um, and I had one that was really concerning and got into some trouble, but most of them were minor. But the interesting thing about the side effects is they're not really side effects. One of the thing, things I found out about these drugs is they're just effects. Um, some of them are effects that the doctors want you to have that, because they accomplish what they're aiming at, but some of them are just the effects of the drugs. And you can't have one without the other. You know, if you don't get the effects of the drug, you don't get the effects of the drug. But if you do, you get things that we call side effects. And one of them I had, as I said, uh, was apparently unique to me. I could find no mention of it in the literature that I read anywhere. And when I brought it up to my doctors, they kind of said, okay, if you say so. They had never heard of it before uh, or since, and actually was not the only time I had a, a side effect that was peculiar to me. Anyway, this unusual side effect was that my sense of smell significantly improved for a while, <laughs> dramatically, actually. Uh, you know, due to a lifetime of allergies and sinus problems, uh, I, my olfactory abilities have degraded to almost useless. And, you know, in the last uh, 15 months, I've had three different CAT scans in my head. So I've had my head examined a lot. (laughs) Um, And every report from those ones has mentioned um, evidence, obvious evidence of severe chronic sinusitis. And my response has been, well, duh. You know, I knew that without the test. But um, the interesting thing is, all you know, we've, throughout our married life, we've frequently had this conversation. Lori is at the other extreme of the spectrum from me uh, when it comes to olfactory abilities. She has a sense of smell that is exceeded only by that of dogs. You know, it's amazing. Uh, and we've had this conversation where she'll say, what is that smell? And I'll say, what smell? I don't smell anything. Well, the amazing thing is I had this side effect where all of a sudden it would be, I'd say, do you smell that? What is that? And she'd go, what are you talking about? I don't smell anything. And it was amazing. Uh, You know, unfortunately, it was only temporary. And by now, it has faded. Um, And that's kind of sad because smells really add to our experience of life. And they often can be wonderful. Uh, They're not always wonderful. You know, for a brief time, when I was in college, I dated this uh, young lady who actually lived about 10 miles from my campus, lived on a dairy farm. Yeah, and every time I picked her up at her home there in Chino, I got this full whiff of eau de bovine, you know. It was, around, even with my substandard ability, it was not a dreamy aroma. And after she jilted me, I, I used to tell people that every time I smelled cow manure, it made me think of her. But, uh, you know, for me, she was in the same category as the now Los Angeles Chargers, who also jilted, jilted me and also smell of eau de bovine. But anyway, <laughs> that obviously was not a pleasant odor um, or a pleasant memory, actually, now that I think about it. But anyway, there are a number of aromas, though, that evoke wonderful memories and wonderful feelings, aren't there? One of them I think of that's obvious for me is, and I've mentioned it many times, there was this bakery in Bakersfield, Smith's Bakery, that has, you know, their jelly donuts 
are what other jelly donuts wish they were. I mean, they are to die for. They're unbelievable. And the aroma in that bakery was phenomenal. It just, you would walk in there and it was just like, I'm in heaven. The smell was delicious. And actually, they, they, the bakery was about a block from our house, and I could wake up in the morning and you'd, the odor from that bakery would waft up our street, and oh, man, it smells so good. It's like, I need to get donuts, you know? Um, and the interesting thing about that is I have been to many, many donut shops and bakeries since, and most of them smell really good, but none of them have, none of them have quite that same smell. There was only one other place I can ever remember that had that same smell of Smith's, and it was at a bakery across the street from my grandparents' house, uh, across Woodland Avenue in Cleveland. Uh, it had the same smell, but everywhere else it's good. It's not quite the same. And now you're thinking, why are you talking about aromas? Well, they're making you hungry. Yeah, because in 2 Corinthians 2.14, Paul wrote, Thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ's triumph and possession, a procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. We are to spread the aroma of Jesus Christ. It's to be that kind of powerful aroma that I just was talking about. It's appealing and beautiful. But what exactly is that aroma? What, you know, what is the smell that we're talking about? Uh, we're going to get a glimpse of one component of that aroma today that's very important uh, as we look at John 16, we continue studying John 16, verses 14 through 24, where this is the night, Jesus is last night with his men. He's giving them his final teaching before he's going to be arrested and then ex executed the next day. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then, after a little while, you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you'll see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, because I'm going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another about what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. So the first thing I think it's important for us to notice here is that the Holy Spirit, one of the main things that he does is glorify Jesus Christ. Uh, and verse 14, Jesus made the statement that one of the characteristics of the work of the Spirit is it glorifies Jesus. And that's much the same thing he had said in chapter 15, uh, verse 26, where he said, When the Advocate comes, the Holy Spirit, when I, whom I will send to you, the Spirit of truth, who is after the Father, he will testify about me. So the Holy Spirit, the main thing he does is communicate truth about Jesus. Uh, and that's what he's going to do in our lives. And so uh, we see that a lot in the other places in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Paul wrote, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit declares Jesus is Lord through us. And then in 2 Corinthians 2.14, and we're already, already quoted, he said, this is what the Holy Spirit is going to produce. He's going to spread the aroma of Jesus through believers in Jesus. Uh, it's interesting that in that 2 Corinthians 2 passage, he went on, Paul did, in verses 15 to 16 to say this, We are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death, and to the other, an aroma that brings life. So the aroma of Christ is an interesting aroma because to some people, 
It, is, it speaks of life and joy and beauty. And to others, it speaks of death. And here, you know, the reality is that, man, death, that's not a good smell. In my freshman year in college, there was a guy that lived in my dorm, fortunately not in the suite I lived in. This guy was the king of slobs. I mean, I've never met anybody or seen anybody that was as bad as this guy was. And it, it became a problem because after a while, his room started to just reek, had an unbelievably horrible aroma. It was just was unbearable. And so finally, the other guys in the suite said, we, we can't stand this. we got to do something. And while he was out, they managed to get into his room, that we're just going to clean it up and get rid of whatever the smell is. Well, they found out what it was. A possum had crawled into his room, crawled under his bed, and died. And that's what the smell was. Yeah, like I said, the guy was a slob. How could he live with that? Um, you know what? The smell of death was horrible. Um, and there are people, and this is something we need to remember, is that there are some people for whom the smell of Christ is going to be just offensive. Um, Paul warned that. This is not always going to be popular. And for Paul, it, giving off the aroma of Christ wasn't always a fun thing. You know, he got imprisonments and beatings and opposition and rejection why would the aroma of Christ bother people? Well, it's because he represents for them the threat of condemnation and judgment. Nobody likes to have someone say, you are guilty, and here's the things you're guilty of, and because of it, you're deserving of judgment. In his book, Ends and Means, the British uh, writer Aldous Huxley uh, admitted that he didn't want a world with meaning, in particular, one with God as judge. Because he understood if there is no judge, there's really ultimately no meaning to life. But if there is a judge, then there's meaning. And so he said he didn't want that. And here's, here's why. This is, I quote, he said, A meaningless wor world frees me to pursue my own erotic and political desires. I want to do whatever I want to do, and I don't want to have to answer for it. And if there's a God out there, then I, I'm going to have to answer for it, and I don't want that. And I don't like it when somebody says that there is a God out there. Thomas Nagel is a professor of philosophy at New York University. In a moment of revealing honesty, he wrote, I want atheism to be true and am un made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. And when you come along and you give off the aroma of Christ, that's going to be really upsetting to that guy. Unfortunately, way too often, Christians have given off an aroma that's stinky because they stress all the wrong things. You know, instead of grace... They smell of law and righteousness, self-righteousness, I should say, and judgment. Instead of love, they smell of pride and rejection of others. Instead of peace and joy, they smell of division and complaint. And of course, that's a bad aroma, but that's not the aroma of Christ. The aroma of Christ, as we're going to see, is very different than that. So that's the first thing. Holy Spirit's going to cause... The, Jesus Christ to be known, and through us that means he's going to, and the people that the Holy Spirit is in is going to give off the aroma of Christ. So here's a second thing that we can see in this passage, and that is that the disciples' grief would turn to joy. Um, verse 16, Jesus says something that kind of sounds like, well, now you see me, now you don't. You know, He says, well, you're going to see me for a little while, and then you're not going to see me for a little while, and then you are going to see me, and it's kind of like, uh, what? What are you doing here, you know? Uh, we were with our uh, grandsons, Hunter and Wesley. Uh, Hunter is 18 months old, you know, and um, at one point uh, we were sitting there, and he was sitting on the couch, and I was sitting by him, but I held a pillow up in front of my face, and then I would drop the pillow down and go, peekaboo, and he would laugh. He thought that was hilarious. And then I'd hold it back up, 
And I'd drop it back down, peekaboo, and he would laugh. I did it 10 times, and every time he thought it was hilarious. You know, now you see me, now you don't, now you see me, or now you, now you don't, now you do, now you don't, now you do. Every time it's funny, and you know, is that what, sounds like Jesus is going to play peekaboo. And that's not what he's saying. He said, pretty soon you're going to weep and mourn, and the world is going to rejoice. Well, Why? Well, the world is going to rejoice because Jesus was a thorn in their side. The Jewish religious leaders and the Romans both just, he was a troublemaker in their eyes. And when he was executed, they were happy. But for the disciples, it was the worst day they'd experienced in their lives up to that point. It was horrifying. Can you imagine seeing this man? They, they had come to believe this man, he is divine. It, it, he is the son of God, and now he's on a cross being smocked and scorned and tortured, and he's going to die. Horrifying. But Jesus said, I'm going to be put in a tomb, and you're not going to see me. But in a little while, you will see me, meaning he's going to come out of that tomb and be alive again. And he said, you're weeping and your misery and your sorrow is going to turn into joy when you realize what has happened. It's interesting, Jesus used the birth, uh, the birth of a child as an analogy for what was about to happen. And uh, I think we can understand that. You know, in our family, pregnancy has been a terrible ordeal. You know, for Lori, it was hard. Uh, she had sort of morning sickness, but more evening sickness. You know, she, she would, every time it was dinner time, she would get this ooh, bad look on her face. And, you know, she'd open the refrigerator to get something out to cook and go, oh, and head for the bathroom and throw up, you know. I lost weight every time Lori was pregnant, you know. It's like, oh, chunky soup for dinner again tonight, you know. Um, so uh, that was bad, but both Carissa... And Anna, our daughter and daughter-in-law, their pregnancies were much worse. Both of them spent time in the hospital when they were pregnant because of difficult pregnancies. And both of them had to do bed rest. And both of them, you know, Carissa was sick the entire nine months, terribly sick. Anna experienced pain, uh, you know, just a lot of pain in her. And then her, you know, just awful, her, uh, both of them, actually both Carissa and Anna have said, you know, I would really like to have another child, but I can't deal with another pregnancy. And actually, Anna's doctor told her, you must not get pregnant again because it's going to be dangerous for you. Um, that's what pregnancy has been. Well, Johnny, tell them what they won for enduring pregnancy. Congratulations, you won the pain of labor and delivery. You know, you go through nine months and this is the reward at the end. You go through this pain that is, those who have gone through it tell me it's the worst thing they've ever experienced, the worst pain ever. You know, I, I, Lori, um, the, her last, when she was pregnant with Toby, uh, the doctor said, okay, she was going to have to have a C-section. They already knew that because she'd already had one. And so um, they said, well, we're going to schedule the C-section a week before his due date. And we had just been through having a child who was born premature, and it had been, uh, and he didn't survive, and it had been horrifying. And we said, oh, man, we, early we don't, nah. and they said, no, it will be fine, and we don't want Lori going into labor. So we said, okay. So she's going to be scheduled for C-section a week before the due date. So we were happy, looked forward to knowing she wasn't going to have to deal with all the labor and delivery because she was going to go in before she was in labor. And they were going to give her the epidural, and she was going to get the energy, and that was going to be great. And then a week before the date of the, the operation was scheduled, she went into labor. And we got down to the hospital, and it was standing room only. There were no operating rooms ready, available, because they were all full. And so they put her in a labor room and said, okay, go through labor, you know. And, you know, she didn't throw anything at me, but, you know, she wasn't real happy with me when I explained to her that she wasn't doing it right, you know. It was awful. Fortunately, we got through that. Here's the thing that happens, though. 
all that difficulty, months of the difficulty of pregnancy and then the, the stress and the pain of delivery, once that baby is born, it's all forgotten. I mean, it's not literally forgotten, but it's like it doesn't matter anymore because there is this unbelievable joy. Boy, when, as you know, those of you who are parents, when that baby is born, there's no explaining the joy that you experience. It's like there's joy and there's love that you didn't even know existed in the world, that your whole new part of your heart opens up. And the joy is overwhelming. And that is what Jesus said was going to happen to these disciples. When their lives were crushed and torn apart, when Jesus was executed, and then Jesus came out of that tomb, and the joy was like no joy they had ever experienced in their lives. Because now they knew the truth. This is not just a really great man with a lot of powers. This is God in human form and has come to rescue us and give us a relationship with him that will last forever. You know, we haven't had the experience that Jesus' disciples did of being able to walk physically with Jesus and listen to him and watch him. We didn't have to go through the horror of being there and watching him tortured and executed. And we didn't have the unbelievable experience of seeing him alive after he'd been in the tomb. But we have had a very similar experience of having him become real and bring life to us. And that life is the source of the joy that Jesus said we need most of all. Jesus has said repeatedly on this night in uh, John 14, 15, and now 16, that joy is what he wants for us, and joy should be a mark of those who believe in him. And here's the amazing thing about that joy that the disciples were going to experience and that we have experienced in Christ. Nothing can take it away. No one will take away your joy. You know, you you read that and you think, well, that's a little weird. You know, why would someone want to take someone else's joy away? That's, you know, you'd have to be a real Scrooge to want to take other people's joy away. But the reality is, I think Jesus is talking here about the nature of life. The nature of life is that joy doesn't last. That something comes along and takes it away, always. You know, we have a saying, all good things must come to an end. Right? And we say that because it's true. Nothing lasts forever, including good things that bring us joy. Um, Why is it that way? Why is it that all good things must come to an end? You know, where is the where is it that says life has to be like that? Well, There's a couple of reasons. One of them is that we have just seen earlier in uh, this section of the scripture in chapter 14, and that is that we have an enemy. And the thing we need to recognize is that Satan, our enemy, despises joy. He hates it. And the reason is God is the source of joy. God is the most joyful person in existence God is characterized by joy, and Satan hates everything that has to do with God. And so when he sees joy, it reminds him of God, and he hates it, and he tries to destroy it. He's trying to eradicate it. His dream for you and me is that we would be utterly joyless. He wants us to be despondent people who feel sorry for ourselves and are continually negative and complaining. That's what Satan wants. So he might try to work it so that we pursue fleeting joys, you know, momentary joys, because he knows if we pursue those, we will get the joy, but then it won't last, and we will be frustrated and disappointed and maybe even angry and confused, and he'll be happy. 
Pursue these joys knowing that they won't last. That's what he wants for us. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of the experience is that we live in a broken world. You know, evil has invaded our world. It invaded all of creation. It touches everything in creation. And that means that good things are going to be impacted by evil by being ended, if nothing else. You know, Lori uh, was expressing some frustration recently at her, because her closet, where she keeps her sweaters, was kind of a mess. And she, it had been a mess, and she had, uh, a couple of years ago, got fed up with that and said, i got to do something about this to get this more organized because it's annoying. And so she went, actually, she found and bought some dividers for the shelf in her uh, closet where she keeps her sweaters and she got them all and she put these dividers in and got them all nice and neatly organized and all there's all great and she was expressing frustration recently because it's a mess again it's like how does that happen well you know there's a law that you know we know the law of entropy which ultimately means everything is going to tend toward disorder unless you put energy into it effort into it. And the, the problem is you go in your closet and you organize everything. And if you don't keep organizing it, keep doing it, it just becomes unorganized, disordered. That's how life is. And there's also a kind of a parallel, I would call it not the law of entropy, but the law of evil. That the law of evil is going to come in and touch everything and it's going to mess it up. We have joy, it's wonderful for a time, but one of two things is going to happen. Either some person or something is going to come along to ruin it, or it's just eventually going to erode. It just kind of goes away. And we all know this is true. I'm experiencing it right now. A year ago, I had incredible joy because the San Diego Padres were acting like a team I'd never seen before in San Diego. They were spending money, and they were building a team that was made of actual good players. And they built a team. They spent ridiculous sums of money to make a team that I thought, this is the best Padre team I have seen in 40 years of being a Padre fan, and they're going to win the World Series, maybe. They, they've got the ability to do it. How did that work out? turned out to be the most disappointing Padres team in history. And right now what's going on is all of a sudden the Padres are trading away those players because they can't afford them anymore and they're turning back into the Padres. And the joy of a year ago, gone. Now I'm looking at them going, oh boy, you got to be kidding me. That's life. That's how it goes, isn't it? Especially when you live in San Diego. and you're going, I don't know, anyway. But um, Jesus claimed th the disciples and his followers, us, are going to experience a joy that will not be touched by that law. Nothing will take it away. A joy that will be permanent. Um, you know what? It's interesting to think about Jesus' analogy that he used here, the analogy of childbirth and the joy that it brings. One of the things that I have found, I'm sure you all, all of you parents feel the same way, is that that is also a joy that never goes away. It changes a little bit. You know, you might think, well, okay, it fades a little bit, you know, when you, the baby is born and it's amazing, and then they send you home from the hospital without a user manual, you know, and you get home and the baby is crying and it won't sleep and you don't know what's going on and it's frustrating and, it, you're, and you're tired and you just want to sleep, you know, and it's hard, you know, and that's not joyful. And then you get through that stage and then you get the terrible twos. And the, the, your child has learned to master the art of the tantrum. And they like to use that art, uh, uh, express that art, particularly in the most public of places, you know, and that's not joyful. And then they become, later on, they become teenagers when 
um, admitting that they have parents is humiliating <laughs> to them, you know? And they're, they want you to know that they are deeply ashamed of you, you know, and <laughs> would prefer that they not have anything to do with you, and you, that's not joyful. But here's the interesting thing. Through it all, those, some of those things are not joyful. Those children are a source of unending joy through all of it. They are the, one of the greatest joys of your life to this day. Our kids and our grandkids are unbelievable sources of joy. Even when the grandkids are throwing a tantrum, we have great joy in them. It's a joy that doesn't go away. And Jesus said... This joy that he's going to give that comes not from our circumstances but from him will never die and nothing can ever take it away. So let's think about some of the implications of that and kind of pull this together. First thing I think it's important for us to recognize is that joy is an element of the aroma of Christ. That is what he exudes, and when his spirit is in us, that is what we will exude as well. Um, you know, Jesus has made clear in this passage uh, in John 15 and John 16 that um, love is certainly a part of that aroma, a huge part of it. He said, if you don't love, you're not even my disciple. This is how people will know my, you're my disciple, that you love. That is the aroma of Christ. But another aspect of that aroma, big, important aspect, is joy. And you see that a lot in the New Testament. In Romans 12, 12, it tells us, be joyful in hope. And, and we need to recognize that is a command he didn't say, well, I hope you're joyful, you know. I hope things go well and you can have some joy. Uh-uh. Command, be joyful in hope. You have a choice. You can be joyful in hope that you have in Christ. So do that. Be joyful in hope. And um, Philippians 4.4, 4, Paul says, while he was in prison, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will tell you, rejoice same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always. Psalm 5.11 says, let all who take refuge in you, God, rejoice and let them ever sing for joy. Psalm 118.24, familiar, says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is a characteristic of the people who know God, the people who have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. They're going to be joyful. Psalm 1611, David said, in God's presence is fullness of joy. This is the ultimate in joy. It's in having a relationship with God. Jesus made it crystal clear that one aspect of his, this aroma of Christ is to be joyful. And you know what? That makes sense. That we have this joy because of a person. Um, Thinking about this reminded me of one of the most joyous days of my life. It was August 24th, 1979, the day that Lori and I got married. You know what? Not everything for me on that day was perfect. There were some things that actually were a, we had in our wedding that I didn't want. You know, Lori had come and he asked me, well, you know, we want to, what do you think about doing this? I said, I don't, I don't want to do that. We did that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> had a couple of those things. Uh, and I was wearing a tuxedo. A tuxedo is not made for comfort. You know, it's not like, oh, you know what? I think what would really be comfortable to wear today is a tuxedo. They're just uncomfortable. Now, I wasn't real happy about wearing a tuxedo. And none of that mattered because I was marrying Lori. And just that relationship with her made everything else unimportant. Wear the tuxedo, include that in the wedding. I don't care because I'm marrying her. And that's what matters. And I still feel that to this day. 
if you can have that kind of a joy in a person, isn't, doesn't it make sense you can have that kind of joy in the most magnificent, beautiful, loving, gracious, good person that exists? Relationship with God. David said, fullness of joy is found right there. And that's a joy that never goes away. But second thing we need to know, that joy will be attacked. There will be things, Jesus said, that will try to take away your joy. Um, you know, what are things that can take away your joy? Well, people can, you know. They can be difficult. Um, guilt, fear, anxiety, anger, loss, all of these things that are things that try to erode our joy. That's why Satan uses them, try to drive uh, the joy out of us with these things. You know, no matter how joyful you are, in this world, your joy can vanish in an instant. And, and the truth is, you know, the temporary joys of this world are good things. God gives them to us as blessings and says, enjoy them and be thankful for them. But we need to recognize if, if it's not attached to something that's permanent, the joy cannot be permanent either because the thing will change and the joy will go away. Permanent joy only comes from something that's permanent and unchanging, and there's only one of those things in all of existence, and that's God. So that's why this brings us to this great news, and that is that there is permanent joy available. You know... Uh, grave difficulty was ahead for the disciples when Jesus said these words. It was going to be frightening, hurtful, excruciatingly painful. But those terrible things could never take away the truth that um, Jesus conquered death. You know, they were looking at a future that Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. All of the disciples were persecuted. All of them but one were martyred. And that one, John, lived in exile. He was also persecuted, jailed, you know, abused, oppressed. It was hard. It wasn't fun. But the joy never went away because Jesus had conquered death on their behalf and had having a relationship with God through him. In 2 Corinthians 6.10, Paul wrote something really interesting. He said he was sorrowful yet always rejoicing. And that right there reminds us of what this world is like. There are going to be times when we're sorrowful, when there are hard, painful things that happen, and we don't deny the pain and the sorrow of them. But the pain and the sorrow of those things does not ever take away the joy that we have because Jesus conquered death for us. Jesus died for us, conquered death for us, so we have a relationship with God that will never be taken away. We have the hope that comes with that. We have his presence. We have his peace and his love with us always. And that brings us joy, even in the midst of sorrow. You know, um, back, uh, I remember when uh, Toby was in college, he was going to school up at uh, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. I saw an example of the kind of thing I'm, we're, I'm talking about here. Is, um, right before Thanksgiving one year, I don't remember which year it was, I, it, but we were, Toby was going to come home for college, and just before Thanksgiving, Lori got a cold, a bad cold. And so, you know, she felt awful, and it was, was like Monday and Tuesday of that week, and, you know, we were going to have a big group of people in our house for Thanksgiving, and Lori was all of that preparation was going to fall on Lori, and she was feeling terrible. And so um, Toby was going to drive home, and I think it was like a Tuesday night. Um, and uh, Toby had learned, you know, to get from San Luis Obispo to San Diego, you have to drive through Los Angeles. <laughs> he learned, I don't, I'm not going to drive through there except late at night when the traffic is only horrendous. 
as opposed to cataclysmic, you know. So he, he was planning to get home around midnight. Um, so by about 8.30 that evening, Lori was just, she was just dead. She said, I, I feel horrible. I got to go to bed. I said, okay, I'm going to stay up and wait for Toby. Go to bed. I hope you, you know, rest well and feel better in the morning. She went to bed. Well, Toby got home about midnight, and Lori came out of the bedroom. Uh, and because Toby was home, and I thought, well, she's going to come, home, come out and greet him, say, oh, I'm glad you're home. I'm, I'm going back to bed. She didn't. She stayed up for two hours till 2 o'clock in the morning, animated, happy, full of joy, because Toby was home. And she got to be with Toby instead of just me. <laughs> you know, um, she just was so happy because of a person was there. She didn't feel good. You know, the cold hadn't gone away. She still had the stress of all the stuff that was going on. Everything that was still there was still there. But there was joy there because of a person. That's what Paul meant by sorrowful yet rejoicing. We can have hardships and will have hardships, and they will be difficult and sorrowful for us. But because of a person, because of Jesus Christ, we can have joy. You know, to have permanent joy, it must be the result of a permanent blessing. Great to have the transient joys of this world enjoy them but our bedrock joy is in our relationship with God. If my joy is grounded in anything else, it's going to go away. So let's think about for just a minute the things that can take away our joy. Um, one of them is regret or guilt. You know, when we have a lot of regrets, when we have guilt in our lives, we're not going to be joyful. There are two things we can do to defeat regret and guilt. The first one is make the most of every day so we don't live with the regrets. You know, be fully present every day. Seize the opportunity. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in this day. But I'm, it's important for us, I think, to recognize when we think about make the most of the day and seize the opportunity, people tend to think of, oh, we've got to do exciting things, you know, and, go, and that's not it. Here's how you make the most of the day. You do the right thing. You serve God today with all your heart. If you do that every day, you'll never have regrets. And if you don't, you will have regrets, inevitably. So... Make the most of the day by making today the day that you serve God with all your heart. And then the second thing that comes with that is live in the truth of the forgiveness that we have in Christ. All of us are going to fail at times. There are going to be things we're going to say, oh, I wish I would have done this different. I wish I would have done that. Here's the thing. We're forgiven. We're loved. And we need to live in the reality of that. And that's what enables us to deal with the, the guilt that we all experienced when it, uh, to one level or another. So that's important. That's how That will help us defeat the things that try to take a, our joy away. A second thing that tries to take a, our joy away is fear. You know, I had an appointment with my oncologist uh, about a week and a half ago, and uh, this is to set up the monitoring phase of my care. My treatments are done. Now it's monitoring and... Uh, so the next on the calendar uh, for me will be in um, probably around March. I'm going to have a CT scan. They're going to do a CT scan of my chest. And I thought, well, that's a little weird. Um, I asked him, well, why are you going to do a CT scan of my chest? And he said, well, uh, we know the melanoma is gone. We can, on your head, we can see that where it used to be, it's gone. It's all healed up, and that's all gone. That's taken care of. But he said, we want to be careful to watch for the melanoma uh, coming back and the place it will most likely come back if it comes back is in your lungs. So that's why we look at the chest. I didn't want to hear that, you know. That's my reality. It's like what I wanted to hear is, oh, you're done with melanoma forever and it will never come back and now you don't have to worry about that anymore. Well, that's, you know, might happen. We pray that happens, could happen. But cancer is pretty insidious, and you never know. Um, 
And what I find is it's very easy to get obsessed with things like that and start thinking, oh, man, what if it comes down? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? What if? You know what? Um, the past year has been a reminder for me that fearing what might happen in the future keeps me from rejoicing and being glad in today. So let's not do that. Let's say, you know what? I'm not going to worry about that future. It may or may not come. I don't have any control over that. God does. I leave it in his hands, and I focus on there's only one day that any of us knows we actually have, and that is this day. None of us knows we'll even be alive tomorrow. We think we will. We hope we will, but we can't say for sure we will. The day we know we have is this one, and that's why the scriptures say, let's be glad in this day. And the thing that has enabled me to be joyful in the midst of all of that we've been going through the last year is saying, I'm just going to focus on today. And being thankful for this day, I've got a day today, let's make the most of it. Here's another thing that we're going to have to deal with, and that's discontentment. You know, Lori was uh, taking care of Hunter recently, and uh, she, Lori, Lori is amazing uh, how creative she is with the, the kids and how she plays with them, and she runs them ragged, you know, because she's always got something doing. And you know, so, so this particular day, little Wesley, it was in the afternoon, and he was very tired. He was getting near nap time, and he needed a nap, but uh, his nap time wasn't quite yet. And so he, uh, Lori said, well, would you like to just sit down and watch TV? Yes, he wanted to do that. And so Lori said, okay, she'll put on, turn on TV, and she put on Winnie the Pooh. He didn't want Winnie the Pooh. And he just melted down. It was, I thought, I thought, I was upstairs when this happened, and the screaming, I thought he'd horribly injured himself. And, you know, I came running out, what's wrong, what's wrong? And he doesn't want Winnie the Pooh. You know, oh, okay, well, I guess we can survive that, you know. We'll put on Bluey, and it got better. It's fine, you know. Um, and what I find is that what happens with us is that we let the disappointments destroy our joy. Well, I'm not getting what I want, and if I don't get what I want, then I can't be joyful. I'm going to melt down here and have a tantrum, you know. Wait a minute, that's discontentment. That doesn't do us any good at all. It takes away our joy. The best way we can uh, get over that is by focusing on the joy we have and saying whatever about the discontentment. You know, one time, Lori and I... Um, Lori and I were at, um, there was this hotel, this resort that we had walked through once or twice. It's in Maui, and it was magnificent. And we thought, oh, man, wouldn't it be awesome to stay at this place? So beautiful, but we'll never be able to stay here because it was way out of our price range. Well, a number of years ago when the recession is on, the hotels suddenly became very reasonably priced. Uh, you know, and we actually bid on Priceline, and we got this hotel, and the price was like, well, it's just a little bit more than a Motel 6. It was awesome. So we're at this hotel that was just magnificent. We're just going, this is amazing. We're staying at this place. It's so spectacular. And one day, I don't even remember what I had to do. I had to deal with something at the front desk. I'm at the front desk. And standing very close to me, I couldn't help but overhear the conversation. There was a gentleman was having with one of the employees. And he was not happy. He was complaining and he had all these things. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know. It turned out this guy had an oceanfront suite. It was one of the best rooms in that resort. You know, we were in the room. It's like, oh, well, this used to be the dungeon. You know, you can go in there. That was what we had. We were thrilled because we were just so happy being there. But this guy had this unbelievable room but he was nitpicking like crazy because he had very high expectations. He wanted this and he wanted this and he was demanding and angry and unhappy. And I thought, who do you suppose is having the more joyful, happier vacation? Him or us? Well, it was us. He wasn't happy because he had demands. He expected it and he didn't want this and this and this and he just like, 
complaining, ruining his own vacation. We can do the same thing. We have our expectations. We have things, we want things, and if we don't get them, we're going to melt down. That discontentment just wipes out the joy. That's time for us to say, you know what? This is the day the Lord has made. What God supplies is enough. I'm going to trust God to give me what he thinks is good for me, and I'm going to rejoice in what he gives, whatever it is. That's how we experience joy. The biggest thing for us is to not let the disappointments of this life eclipse the greater joy, the greater good that we have. Years ago, uh, <laughs> Lori and I got to go with our then uh, single adult children to Disney World in Florida. And uh, we were staying at one of the Disney resorts there in Disney World. And this particular resort, they, well, they all had, you know, they would have a, a, several restaurants at the resort, and they had a, a store there where you could buy sundries and some food items that you could take back to your room, you know, cereal and things like that and a bunch of different things. But of course, it's Disney, so they don't ever miss a chance to do merchandising. And so in the store, of course, you could buy Disney paraphernalia and souvenirs and all kinds of stuff. So I'm in this store. I think I went to get cereal as, a, as, as what I was doing. I, I happened to notice there was a, a family. There was a mom and dad and three kids. One of them was a little cute four-year-old girl. The four-year-old girl son had found one of those uh, big suckers, you know, that they're, they're like on the stick and they're about that big around, that she decided she wanted. Yeah, I had the round thing. That's okay. You guys know that. She wanted that sucker. And um, there, you know, they said, well, we're going to have dinner. We won't, don't want to get you the sucker because you're going to eat that and you won't eat dinner. And so, no, no sucker now. Oh, please, I want the sucker. I need to have sucker so bad. You know, and she went on and on and on. Pretty soon, she melted down. And I watched that and I thought, little girl, you need to take a step back and say, where am I? I am in Walt Disney stinking world. My parents have spent thousands of dollars to travel here and to put us in a hotel so that we can go from one amusement park extravaganza to another for all week. And you have all of this going on, and now you're throwing a fit because you want a sucker. Maybe you need to think about the bigger picture about what really matters. I didn't have that conversation with her, but I sure thought about that. And I sure thought, God must have that same conversation with me sometimes. You need to get back to the bigger picture. Remember the gift that you have in Jesus Christ. And it's permanent. And the more I'm focused on that gift, the more joy I'm going to have that can never be taken away. Let's focus on the joy we have in Christ because it's forever and it will not fade. Let's pray. <coughs> Excuse me. Father, we thank you for the joy that you have given to us in Christ. And we admit to our own chagrin and disappointment that we often let it be chipped away by these other things, by fear and discontentment. Help us, Lord, to turn back to the truth that we have of what we have in you, to your grace in our lives, to the victory of Jesus Christ and what it means for us, to your love for us, and to experience your joy regardless, and to be at times sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Help us, Lord, to live in the truth of your joy and to give off the aroma of Jesus, which is an aroma of joy. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's please stand for our last song. It's the most joyful one I could find this week, and it sings about our gift that we have because of Jesus.
was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I've tried to hide. Oh, it was my tomb. And thanks for being here. We love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday night at 4 o'clock. Merry Christmas. Okay.